Hi, I'm Lou. This is the Service Design Show, and this is episode 205. Lou Down is back with a new book, Bad Services, which is still a working title, is a diagnostic tool for identifying the root cause of service failures. In this episode, we'll dive into the organizational patterns that lead to bad services and discover practical steps anyone can take to make a difference. If you're new here, welcome to the Service Design Show, the show where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's truly needed to design great services that resonate with people, push our businesses forward, and honor our planet. Our guest today needs a little introduction. Lou Down is a service design legend, literally writing the book on it twice. Not only did she pen the acclaimed good services, but she also was the director of design at Government Digital Services in the UK. And today she runs a school of good services. So yeah, she knows a thing or two about designing services that actually work for people. But did you also know that her interests range from bacteria and fungi to sailing and filmmaking? A truly T-shaped person if there ever was one. In today's conversation, we explore how the understanding of service design has changed over time and debate about whether it's a profession, field, or maybe even a secret society, why it's crucial for organizations to prioritize the delivery of good services, not just the design of them, the potential drawbacks of requiring specific qualifications for service design roles, how using language that is less exclusive can help to involve more people in service design and foster diversity within our field. And you'll get actionable tips for organizations looking to build and grow their service design capabilities. If anything, I encourage you to pay close attention to the part where Lou and I dive headfirst into the messy complex and often frustrating world of organizational change. We openly ask the question whether it might be better to throw out the rule book and embrace a little anarchy. So brace yourself for some real talk about the power struggles, the bureaucratic battles and the hard won victories that come with trying to change how a company operates for the better. I hope this got you excited for an inspiring conversation with our returning guest, Lou Down. Let's jump right in and I'll catch you at the end for my closing reflections. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to the Service Design Show. A welcome back on the show, Lou. Thanks for having me. It's been a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> this is the quiz question. Do you know when it was when you first appeared on the show? I have a terrible sense of time. Uh, so uh, you, it could be five years, it could be 10 years, it could be somewhere in the middle. Uh, it was uh, 2017, uh, seven years ago, episode 36. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I highly recommend <laughs> to go back to that episode, see if anything changed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who knows? Uh, I think quite a lot has changed and uh, it's time for an overdue update. Today, uh, Lou, you wanted to talk about um, the secret to moving beyond justifying R slash designers existence. Yeah, I really wanted to talk about that. I'm not going to pretend that I have all of the answers yet, but the reason why I wanted to talk about this was actually because I'm in the process of writing uh, a second book, the sequel to Good Services, which hadn't even come out. I wasn't even the glimmer of an eye uh, <laughs> when uh, we spoke seven years ago. Uh, and this is very much the topic of that book. How do we move beyond uh, constantly having to kind of justify our own 
existence as service designers to actually delivering the services that we spend so much of our time um, carefully designing. So yeah, I really wanted to talk about that with you because I feel like you have some interesting perspectives on this and I'm sure we'll have, yeah, an interesting conversation about it. Yes, there is a lot of talk about justifying our value, whether or not we should do that, how to do that, uh, what the alternatives are. But before we dive into that, could you take us on your journey? So what happened over the last few years that brought you to the moment where we are today? Yeah, wow. So I can't even remember what I was doing seven years ago. So let me just give you like, yeah. I was a GDS, right? Okay, I was just trying to work out if I so, um, yeah, wow. So I uh, started writing Good Services, um, the book about how to design services that work for users uh, towards the end of my time at Government Digital Service. Uh, and at the time I was director of design and service standards um, there. So I started writing the book basically as a way of collecting all of these thoughts about what makes a good and a bad service into one place. Um, in a bid to to hopefully um, get to a point where we didn't have to talk about it anymore. You know, we, we could move the conversation on from rediscovering endlessly uh, that, you know, good services should set people's expectations or they should be findable or they should be accessible or all of the really basic fundamental things that we should all know and we should spend our time focusing on the more important stuff that is unique about our service. Um so yeah, that that book was in the making when we last spoke, um, and it came out um, in February 2020, um, <laughs> which was <laughs> a great time to release a book. I had so many grand plans of you know not not quite doing a, a book tour. That sounds way too grand, but at least talking to people about it in person. And of course, that wasn't possible because of 2020. Um, and yeah, since then I have been running the School of Good Services which is a small but perfectly formed organization. Um, uh, and we basically provide training and coaching and skills development skills, uh, sorry, skills development, um, I'll start that again. Um, we provide training and coaching and support in capability development to organizations who are hoping to uh, design and deliver better services and all of the things that people need to be able to do to, to get that done. So um, yeah, I now run that with Sarah Drummond, who is the ex-co-founder of uh, Snook. So um, yeah, life has changed quite dramatically since. The book uh, has been in many places and often cited here on the show as well. So uh, congrats on putting, and thank you for putting that into the world and looking forward to the sequel. But your story isn't, I feel isn't yet complete because um, something happened between publishing good services and the topic that's on your mind today. And that is how do we, move beyond justifying our existence. So mm -hmm. can you fill yeah. in the gap? I can. So I <laughs> I, I realized I uh, somewhat accidentally left out one of my roles that I had um, between, um, yeah, kind of leaving GDS and, and where I am now, which was that I became um, Director of Transformation for Homes England, which is a um, government, arms link government agency uh, here in the UK that um, basically um, supports house building um, and uh, homes um, up and down the country in different places for different reasons. And part of my role there was taking a big government or organization and helping it to think about how it provided services and delivered its policy objectives in a totally changed environment, um, changed economically, changed in terms of user needs, changed in terms of technology. Um, and what I learned in that time, I think has been really fundamental to thinking about the types of skills that we as service designers need to um, support really to be able to get this type of work done. And so actually my role there was really foundational in creating the School of Good Services and realizing that actually 
probably uh, skills in service design are the things that we actually need the least <laughs> in terms of developing those skills. As service designers, often what we need is the skill to be able to write business cases and to lead large and complicated groups of stakeholders or to prototype our services or to understand our practice in an agile environment. Those are the types of skills that we really need. Um, but they are difficult um, and they are really, really hard to do, um, particularly at scale and particularly for long periods of time. And part of that is also our ability to be able to support the skills development of our organization as well. So, you know, at the School of Good Services, we provide kind of training in two parts, both supporting those um, service designers with all of those other skills that are not service designers, and then helping to lift what often feels like a glass ceiling above those service design advocates to allow the rest of the organization to understand what we mean by services and what we mean by a good and a bad service. Um, so yeah, it was really foundational in thinking about that, but it also led me to uh, this kind of path of thinking that is that whilst there are huge similarities in the types of things that our users need of our services, there are also huge similarities in the things that we need to be able to do as an organization to provide those services. And that really is the kind of foundation for uh, the new book, which will be called something along the lines of bad services <laughs> uh, and how we get there and how we get out of it. Uh, title TBC. So if anyone has any ideas and this podcast goes out before I've decided what the title is, uh, please do let me know. <laughs> so moving between different roles uh your thinking has evolved evolved around what service design entails what it requires uh what skills competencies capabilities we need as professionals what we need as organizations mm -hmm. you started teaching these things still the question that lingers on my mind is apparently one of the skills that we need is to communicate quote unquote, sell our value? Well, yes and no. <laughs> so part, I think partially, yes, we need to be able to translate the benefits that we're seeing and identifying in the services that we're designing into a language that our organization will understand. And quite frequently that is either risk or money more often than not money <laughs> at the root of everything. Even if we do care about risk, we also care about money behind those risks. And the same for organizational objectives. You know, If we care about where we're trying to get to, it's usually because we are trying to reduce costs, we're trying to increase profits. So being able to translate those things into that language that our organization speaks is really important, just as it would be important to translate anything that we're saying into the language of the people that we're speaking to. But I think there's another side to this, and that is um, an element of recognizing when that translation and that need to meet people in the middle becomes a need to go all the way over to the other side, <laughs> go right the way out of your way, um, completely change what you're doing. Um, and there is no meeting in the middle coming from the other side. And I think that is a, there's a real art in spotting where that resistance is in fact hostility and is actually a place where perhaps we may, may need to start thinking about changing role if we can, you know, kind of um, finding safety in our current role or just rethinking how the organization's working. Because I think certainly what I'm hearing is that there is a lot of that going on. Um, and, you know, there is, a, I think, a real nascent mental health crisis, actually, um, in many careers, but certainly in service design. And so I would say that that is also a really important thing to do, to recognize when it's not you, it's them. Have you been in situations where you either in the moment or looking back realized that there was no meeting in the middle and... If so, how, which lessons did you take away from that? I mean, I've been in it. I, I, I'm sure that you have. I'm sure that most service designers, most people who have been practicing or advocating for user-centered design have been in a situation where um, almost like a, you know, a lobster in a pot, the, the heat dials up to the extent that we don't re even really recognize that it's hostility until too late and then we burn out. 
And, you know, one thing that always occurs to me is that the people who care the most are the people who burn out the fastest. And I have recognized that in every single designer that I've managed, every team that I've worked in and in myself as well, the more you care, the more investment you're going to make personally, professionally, the more vulnerable you become to, you know, the funding being removed or the permission environment changing or your boss saying, actually, no, this isn't really, I don't think important and we should do something else. Um, So it's hard for me to put my finger on one single moment because it, to be honest, feels like the drumbeat to my career, you know, and to probably lots of people's careers is being able to recognize when that moment goes beyond just needing to meet someone in the middle to actually being very much in a position where it, it's going to be very difficult for you to make any change. Um, so I think increasingly that is becoming a skill that's really important to recognize, but also you know, you need to have the skills to be able to get to that point in the first place, you know, and and if you're not able to explain your work in financial terms or in a language that the rest of the organization is going to understand, it's going to be very difficult to even get to that middle point in the first place. Um, so I think they are really two halves of the same coin. Um, yeah, certainly in my experience. There is some, um, there's debates going on, um, heated articles on LinkedIn that sort of argue for the fact that we shouldn't view this um, external validation, the need for external validation, as in we don't have anything to prove if the other side doesn't see the value of design. Like it's it's sort of there. It's not a me problem, it's a you problem kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what's your take on that? Gosh, I would support anyone um, who you know, kind of recognizes their own personal boundaries and, and is able to kind of not only think that to themselves, but also to say that publicly and say, look, like I have these boundaries. This is the type of place that I want to work. This is the type of thing um, that I need when I'm working. I think that is completely legit legitimate and absolutely justified. Um, but I think there is also the reality of the working world that we are in at the moment. And certainly the environment that I've started to think of is almost like a austerity service design where certainly here in the UK and I think probably in many other countries we are now in a world where our organizations have become much more reactive um, much more short-term in their thinking much more risk averse much more conservative with a small c and sometimes a big c <laughs> um, and it means that doing big strategic deep change requires us to step out of that way of thinking and i think that is a real skill to learn actually and then that's not got nothing to do with meeting people in the middle that's really about us understanding how that like i said before how that 90 percent of work really happens you know how do we get a large group of people to a consensus and how do we calm the whole situation down so that we can think more long term about our work um and i think you could either say well this is the type of work that i want to do and i i'm gonna just go for it i'm gonna go into an organization that is super risk averse is sh super short-term thinking and i'm gonna help them to do that and you can manage your energy and you can make sure that you're in a safe space to do it or you can say actually no, I don't want to do that work. And I want to go and work for, uh, you know, an organization that's already in that space, possibly in a different industry, maybe a smaller organization, maybe a startup, maybe a charity. And that is also totally valid. So I think there's lots of, what I'm pleased about is the fact that we're having this conversation, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and that we are starting to move beyond that dialogue of, you need to be in the room, you know, kind of lean in canary. <laughs> Um, because it's not right for everyone all of the time. And, and, you know, we're human beings too, I think. I'm curious based on your experience of what you, what you hear, um, from your quote unquote students, have you been able to pinpoint some of the root causes where this res I don't know if resistance is the right word, but, um, this misalignment and misunderstanding about service design is coming from? Mm, yeah, I, I I think so. 
I think I've started to spot some some patterns in it. Um, I'd be really also interested to hear uh, if other people listening to this um, hear the same or different, because this is obviously from the perspective of the people that I'm working with. Um, so what I'm seeing is that there is, um, there's almost a kind of like a holy trinity <laughs> of problems in our organization. And it starts with not knowing or understanding who our users are and what they need. And that often comes from years of being separated from them and only observing them in user research, only observing them when things go wrong, when they call us up in the call center or something fails in a process and only seeing the worst of our users. And so therefore, you know, essentially finding it very difficult to empathize with them or understand who they are. So that's the first part of our triangle. The second part um, is not understanding why we're doing what we're doing in the first place and actually understanding the purpose of our service. So if you take these two things as kind of two halves of the same coin, you know, there's who our users are and what they need. And then there's why are we doing this and what do we want? <laughs> sometimes we don't know that either. And sometimes that's because we provided those services for a really, really long time. And, you know, it's a process of archaeology to work out why they originally were created. And sometimes that like, we're talking hundreds of years, sometimes with some public services that have completely changed form and need in that time. Sometimes it's because over time we just become more focused naturally on talking about how something happens rather than why. It's a limit to how many existential conversations we can have about purpose over a long period of time before we have to focus on the doing of the doing. So, you know, that only becomes a problem when we have loads of staff churn and, and you know, time moves on. So we forget why we're doing what we're doing. We don't know who our users are. And then, and then the kind of middle point of our triangle where those two things converge is that we don't actually know what our services are. And so we look at all of these processes and these systems and forms and tools and widgets and all these other things that we do. And we go, we don't know what people need from them. We don't know why we're doing them. So the only option that we have is to just improve them and to, to make them faster and cheaper and to essentially just, you know, replatform the exact same things digitally if that's what we're doing. And those three things kind of form this kind of triple lock in in service design where it, you kind of have to you have to unpick all three of them in order to be able to really fundamentally do that really deep strategic work and shift an organization into a very different space. And then there are a bunch of things that kind of just sit around the outside of that, things like not really understanding how the internet works or how technology works, which is you know, increasingly problematic, you know, we'll end up making mistakes if we think that, you know, the same service that worked in a physical environment is going to work, you know, in a digital environment where the world is powered by AI. So there's a bunch of other things that go on organizationally that cause problems, but those three are really fundamental to us being able to to properly think about what our services are and what they need to be in the future. I like I like those, those three, and unfortunately, they are very recognizable. Yeah. <laughs> Could you take us back to a moment or a conversation that you had where you sort of really felt that these that these three challenges were roadblocks to moving taking the next step within the organization like I I can imagine what kind of conversations that were but maybe you can sort of uh give some examples this idea, I think, is is more something that actually I've noticed as a, a more of a long term pattern in having conversations with lots and lots of of you know students, essentially people who are coming through the School of Good Services courses. Um, and there's this moment in all of our courses where people start to realise that when we're talking about service design, what we're talking about is understanding our purpose, understanding who our users are and what they need, and understanding therefore what the service should be. And we ask these really radical questions, um, even though they shouldn't be radical, they you know should be part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We, we talk about that, this in all of our courses because it is fundamental to any conversation. And this is usually the bit where that 
if that penny hasn't dropped before, then it certainly does then. And that person is kind of met with the reality of the fact that what we're talking about when we talk about service design is very fundamentally different to the very often quite confined box that they are asked to operate within their organization where they're asked to make things faster better you know kind of uh, more efficient (laughs) different technology all of these sorts of things and then we get to the really real conversation about okay well how do we move forward then you know if this is the environment that we're in and this is what we know to be the right thing to do how do we bring those two those things together. And that that's where the real work kind of starts in realizing that we've got a very different perspective of what we think the work is often to our organization. And when you say we realize, then you're referring to you, what you teach and the students going through a program, for instance, correct? Absolutely. And I, and I would say as well, just to be really clear, the people who are coming on School of Good Services courses are service designers, but they're also everyone else. <laughs> everyone who is an advocate for user-centered design, who wants to learn and understand the language to do that, are represented in those courses. So it's not just a service designer thing, it's anyone who's advoca- advocating for that perspective and that way of working. Um, yeah, it, it faces that moment of, of realization uh, as a group together. So, so what's the aha moment? When does the light bulb go on? I think it usually happens when we start to, um, strangely enough, when we start to do things like thinking about what we should call our service. (laughs) And uh, if you think about it, ultimately it's our user that defines what our service is in these day and age, you know, by what they're looking for, by what they're searching for in that search bar, um, or what they're speaking to their friend or family member or colleague about. Um, It's their language, it's their mental model, their perspective that's defining how they look for that thing and whether or not they find it. And that puts us in a really interesting position where we go, okay, well, therefore, if what they're thinking the service is, is something over here, and that's totally different to what we're providing, (laughs) <laughs> this is like a this is a big difference to kind of being bring those things together so often it can be by asking quite innocent questions like what should we call our service <laughs> or um you know kind of how would we define the outcome what does good look like for an outcome of our service again how could we measure success that will often trigger some of those existential questions of okay why are we there what is the service for in the first place so you don't have to necessarily you know, ask that question obliquely. You don't have to say, you know, okay, <laughs> let's answer these three questions. And then everyone kind of gets a bit resistant. Sometimes you can tunnel in from different directions um, to try and kind of bring people on that that same journey with you. And that's often what we end up talking about is how do the, the people who are on those courses go back to their organization and help their organization go on that journey to understand that actually their services are potentially very far away from where they need to be right now. This reminds me of my meditation practice where one of the instructions is to look for the one who's looking, uh, sort of <laughs> uh, to, to look for the meditator and not finding the meditator is actually defining. So trying to define or find <laughs> the title of your service and not finding it is actually yeah. defining. <laughs> it is. It really is. And it is, you know, I wish there was a, a better way of doing it that didn't require people to go through that pain of of kind of realizing, oh, we've we're doing the wrong thing. But it is, you know, I, understanding that you don't know the answer to those it's questions profound, is the, yeah. it's it's really profound yeah and it's very important to realize that i um, often get uh, a question which uh, makes me a bit unsettled and i still after all those years don't have a good answer to that and i'm very curious to hear your perspective and that is who's doing this well or the question that i always get is can you give an example of a great service mm. i always struggle um uh, <laughs> what what what's your reply to a question like this look i always struggle as well and people ask me all the time because obviously i wrote a book called good services and people go can you think of a good example lou and i am just sat there going I, <laughs> <laughs> you know what i can think of um, usually good examples of where people are doing s- parts of providing a good service. Can I think of anyone who 
who is doing the whole thing well is often much, much harder. And I think part of that is just because we have a bias towards spotting problems, right? That's our job. So, so for something to be working well, nothing has to go wrong. You know, it has to exceed our expectations and our expectations are high. So I don't <laughs> <laughs> I think, and and personally also, I find it much more interesting to find things that are going wrong. I love sniffing out the problems because I think I learn far more from understanding the problems than I do about looking at something that's being done well and trying to copy it because it, it rarely ever is replicable in your own situation. It will always be different. So yeah, understanding how and where and why people have made mistakes, I think often helps us to to make things better more than looking at a great example, or at least that's my excuse. <laughs> I, uh, I totally agree that services are often too, like if you want a good example, you'll come up with a very uh, narrow service, I don't know, serving coffee mm -hmm. in a specific coffee shop, like you, something that is comprehensible. But as soon as you start getting to more rich, complex, diverse examples, then it's really mm -hmm. hard to say that the end-to-end -end service is great. Um, so yeah, I, I also often say it's like you have to look at specific parts and uh, yeah, unsatisfying answer, uh, but yeah. Lou, the other question that I had, and I posted this on LinkedIn uh, by the time that this conversation goes out a few months ago, and it was inspired by the prep call that you and I had. And the thing that I posted was, could it be that organizations don't get design rather that they don't get the value no, sorry, I have to say it right, that they don't get services rather than not getting design. That the inherent value of design is not really hard to comprehend, but not understanding services, you know, that that, that could be the problem. So my question on LinkedIn was, are we looking in the wrong way by thinking that design is the issue? I 100% I agree with you, but I think it's a kind of... Um... It is a two-parted problem because obviously service design includes both the word service and the word design. And both of those words are completely misunderstood. <laughs> so you put them together and the confusion becomes more than the sum of its parts. So you end up with people thinking that you're making a business process more beautiful. <laughs> Why would you want that? <laughs> You know well. what I mean? It's like, <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, I guess maybe maybe making nicer user journey maps. And maybe that's why we spend so much of our time doing that. Gosh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, I think there is this massive misunderstanding of what we mean by a service. And that is fundamental. That's why we spend so much of our time on our courses talking about what we mean by services, because we need to get that right before we ever start talking about design. And you know, talking about designing something where you don't all have an acknowledgement of what that thing is that you're designing is almost impossible. You know, it's like asking someone to design a chair if they've never seen one. You know, it, the same is asking someone to design a service if they think a service is something completely different, a process, a tool, a portal, um, and not how we see it, which is that it's something that helps someone to do something, something that helps someone to achieve that end goal that they're trying to get to. But understanding what that goal is <laughs> and then being really realistic and saying, OK, that goal is a lot, lot bigger than this tiny part that we thought the service actually was, is a journey to, to go on. So, yeah, that's what I always say to people is, is to try, try to remove the word design for now until such point as you've got to the point where you've got everyone on the same page that you all understand what you mean by a service. And then you can talk about the role of design in that space, or you can not, or you can just get on with it. <laughs> exactly. You know, I think actually design is the least important word of, of that whole sentence. And it is the most, uh, yeah, it's the one that carries the most baggage as well. You know, every time I get into a cab and I say to someone, you know, they're like, well, where are you going? What are you doing, mate? And I'm like, I'm a designer. And they're like, oh, all right, fashion. I'm like, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> but no one ever thinks, you know, government systems and processes, do they? <laughs> yeah. And I, I think taking this different lens on the challenge that we're facing 
moves the conversation away from focusing on design towards focusing on services. And I think that's a more interesting conversation to have with the people mm -hmm. in our organizations because we're not the only ones in that situation. Uh, I can yeah, think of absolutely. service management, service marketing, service engineering, like all of those functions, disciplines need to come together. And I'm going to assume that they have the same issue if we don't understand that we're delivering a service, like it doesn't matter if you are marketing or management, we're still going to struggle. Yeah, absolutely. And when you think about the fact that, you know, a service works or it doesn't because it is the product of hundreds of different people often, you know, of which maybe 1%, maybe less will be service designers then being much more inclusive about your language and helping everyone to realize that they have a role to play in providing a better service is going to get you further along that that journey than it will do talking about service design. Because it's like I said, it comes with a lot of baggage. And part of that baggage, I think, is the fact that for many of us at school, design and art we're closely aligned and you weren't good at art or design unless you could draw, unless you had this innate you know, like Raphael skill of being able to draw a perfect circle, you know, and of course that is not what we're talking about when we talk about design, but I think that is a, we have to acknowledge there is a certain exclusivity to that word and to that language that keeps people out of thinking about their role in delivering a better service. And that's why we're called the School of Good Services, not the mm. School of Good Service Design. Exactly. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> I don't want to get too much into semantics, but people who have been following the podcast for a while know that I try to move away from the term service designer. I, I noticed that you used it a few times. I prefer to pre, uh, talk about service design professionals or service design practitioners or service design teams from their perspective that is more inclusive and it allows quote unquote, non designers to participate, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. Um, it's a small nuance, but I do think it matters. Yeah, I think it does. And and I, but I think it is important to, to recognize it is a profession as well. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm totally with you, you know, the language that I use the most is user-centered design advocates, <laughs> because actually a lot of our work in organizations as service designers, user-centered designers, you know, service managers, call center managers is advocating for a user-centric approach, whatever that looks like. And that may be designing services, it may not. So yeah, a hundred percent. But I do think there is also a little bit of gosh, acknowledging that there is a skill and a practice and a profession behind this as well. Um, and that that is important, you know, and that that person should and, and is probably working with all sorts of different design functions and other functions in an organization. And hopefully they're doing that in an inclusive way. But, you know, there are there are skills behind being, you know, a service designer, just as there are skills behind being a service manager, <laughs> you know, or a, you know, kind of engineer or, or any of these other professions. I think that's really important to acknowledge as well. Well, let, let's double click on this because I, I'm not sure. Uh, my mind has changed over the recent mm -hmm. years, whether or not service design is a profession. Uh, I think it's a field comparable to medicine or healthcare. Uh, and you can have people, and I think you mentioned that even with different roles within those team, within those um, areas. And I think everybody, like if you think about car design, I, I'm not sure if we can speak about the car designer. You, you, you can be like somebody participating in a team designing a car and then thinking about, I don't know, materials or interfaces, and then you're part of a car design team. I, I, I sort of am leaning towards that analogy these days. Yeah, I think that's an interesting analogy. I I mean, there are people who call themselves automotive designers, and I guess there are also 
automotive design courses as well. Um, but actually, you know, when I was working at engine service design, we had a lot of people who had an automotive design background, which was really interesting. Um, and yeah, I think it's a good analogy because ultimately, you know, much like a, a vehicle, a service is made up of multiple different parts that require lots of different skills and expertise. Um, so can one individual really say that they are designing every aspect? No, but I think there is an element of the generalism required to bring all of those things together is also a skill, you know, and I think that's where that, you know, we, when we think about T-shaped people, you know, and no one, no, no one talks about this anymore, by the way, T-shaped people. I don't know if it's not the thing anymore, but anyway, when we used to talk about it, it was always about like, okay, what, what's your, what's your downward stroke? You know, what's your like super skill that sits, sits within that? And there was way less importance put on that skill of generalism, of being able to bring all those things together and being the translational layer that, that pushes those things into the right direction. And I think there is a huge benefit to understanding a huge amount of different things to not a great extent <laughs> and to be able to know, okay, well, this is when we need to bring this person in or this is when we need to, to do this thing. Um, but of course that role is totally different in different contexts, right? If you're the only person designing and delivering and managing that service, you know, you are a one person service designer. You, there is no team. If you, and that is the case often in lots of organizations. If you are in the privileged position where you have loads of other people to work with, all of your other automotive team, your service design team, your job is going to be much more about that, that kind of layer of bringing things together and, and perhaps maybe doing other elements. So, so I think it's, um, yeah, I think we're, I think we're kind of meeting in the middle, <laughs> but, but it is a, it's a real tension, isn't it? And it's a conflict between, uh, needing to have some kind of, I suppose, like centrifugal force behind that momentum of thinking about services and talking about service design, but knowing what the right point in time to bring people in and to not be territorial about that and to say, I'm the service designer, so therefore I should do these things. It's a it's a balance, isn't it, of being open and um yeah, having ownership and having momentum and being able to bring those things forward. Yeah. Uh, abs it's absolutely about a balance. And as you said, it's when you're hiring, it's much easier to hire for a service designer, right? Than being very specific. We are looking for a copywriting expert for our service design team. That's probably, I don't know, that that might be harder to uh, hire somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel it's also up to us, people who have been in the industry for a while, to start showing that a one-person service design team isn't, like, that's that's not reality. That's, yeah. uh, that's, a, that's a guarantee to burn that person out and um, it's not going to move your organization forward. So I think we, I don't know, I, I feel that it, I'm, I'm doing my best to add nuance and richness to the idea of what it actually entails to to do service design. I don't, I'm not sure if I'm making sense. No, you're, you're, you are making sense. <laughs> and I agree. And I think that's really important because what we're talking about is the nuance, right? This is not, uh, you know, a clickbait argument. Um, this is about us understanding that those two realities of the fact that service design is everyone's responsibility and also sometimes requires one person to push that forward. Like that, that is the whole conversation. And it really reminds me of when I first joined government digital service and I was brought in as the first service designer with the service design title to the expectation that I would just design all of the services. <laughs> and you're right, it's a recipe for disaster. You cannot design all government services with one single person, that's completely ludicrous, but it, you know that was the expectation. And I think that's also the expectation on service designers as well. And I think that's, there's a lot of this that is really important to acknowledge for the, for the health of service designers that you cannot do everything, you know, and that's important. Exactly, yeah, there, there is a big part in education here and, um... Using the term service design nurse in the past decade has helped us tremendously to establish the field, to bring people together, to create momentum. But I also feel that we're growing up, we're maturing, and now is the moment to start distinguishing uh, between we have 
white wine and we have red wine, like, okay, let's try to distinguish a few flavors and nuances because mm -hmm. they are there. We just start need to start labeling them and educating people about them. Absolutely. And I, I what you said made me think of something else really important about this <laughs> as well. Um, well, why? <laughs> um, I think a large part of this um, professionalization of service design as one singular role, the negative impact of that has been a kind of solidification of what we think the role and therefore the skills and professional qualifications look like for someone to be able to do that job. And what Sarah and I have started to realize is something that we, we've known for a very long time is that that is causing a massive knock-on issue to the diversity of the types of people who end up in those roles. Because when you put out a role that says, you know, service designer, and then you say that person needs to not only have experience in a previous service design role, but they also need to have a service design qualification is you're kind of adding at least like a 50,000 pound price tag on that person's education that they're going to get into that job. And that is absolutely not what we are like aiming to do as a profession i think and what that i'm not against professional service design qualifications i am not against university degrees doing it i think they're fantastic things but i think where we say you have to have that we have to acknowledge the the consequences that that is incredibly exclusive to get into those sorts of roles um and that you know that's not my background that's not sarah's background <laughs> that's not your background i you know like that is not the background of anyone who is in a, a senior you know kind of role who's been doing this for any length of time we did not study this professionally but getting that across and helping to people to understand that actually there's a plethora of different backgrounds experiences perspectives that are so valid and so important to bring into this profession that are not you know the same shape as each other is is vital for the future of the, of the profession and the diversity. And uh, I didn't consider that um, so vividly that adding like a qualification excludes a huge, huge part of the potential talent that could yeah. and that needs to participate in the process. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly when you think about the fact that you know, I think service design is one of those professions that you don't know that it's necessarily exists or that it's needed until such point as you probably already working. You know, that was my experience. And it's the experience of a lot of people who are very much kind of mid-career or early career transitioners into the role when they start to see an organization doing things in a way that don't quite make sense to them. Like me going into the gallery and spotting someone putting up a sign saying, don't use your mobile phone and going, okay, this doesn't quite feel right to me. But, you know, by that point, you're also, you're making it even harder for that person to get that new job because, you know, that person already has a career. They already probably have other qualifications. They're already paying down the debt of, they might have children, they might have caring responsibilities. They, they certainly can't afford to take the time to go and do a university course, you know, um, let alone the cost of that as well. So we're, we're kind of, we're raising the bar just way, way higher than it should be at the moment. So what's your piece of advice for organizations looking to grow their service design capabilities? I mean, firstly, I would say uh, look to understanding what types of services you have um, and look to the types of skills that you uniquely need in the types of people that are going to be pushing that forward. And that will depend on your services, but it will also depend on your ways of working, your governance structures, the level of buy-in in the organization and try to kind of park the idea of that person being called a service designer just for a second, park the idea of that person needing professional qualifications and all of the thing, the kind of just assumptions we make about those sorts of people and just think about the skills that that person needs first and then work backward and go, okay, is this genuinely one person that we're describing? Have we just described a unicorn that doesn't exist? <laughs> is this four or five different roles? And then really carefully, please, please think about where that person should be positioned in the organization. Don't hire one person and expect them to trans 
perform all of the services on their own and just you know expect that person to just weaponize themselves and you know literally like sticky tape be holding these big bits of services together themselves like create a funding structure create an organizational structure create a line management structure that allows that person to thrive and to do that job properly don't expect them to you know Know, come into the organization and make their bed you know it's just it's not fair on on that designer so sorry that was a whole other le- load of things to shoot on into it but yeah first of all think about the skills that you actually need um and yeah before you start thinking about adding professional qualifications and if you do need that person to have professional qualifications you know are there other ways that you can do this could you also perhaps maybe fund that person you know to to have learning and development you know, this is the <laughs> this is the irony of this kind of increasing professionalization is that we're expecting more and more service designers to have degrees in service design at the same time as removing their learning and development funding in our organization. So who's supposed to be paying for this? Like, because it's not us as an organization. It's we're expecting that person to pay. And lo and behold, we find that we have far less diverse teams. Mm. You're like, hmm. <laughs> Whose fault is that? <laughs> this is uh, this is going to be a research study for another time. But uh, in my side, one of my many side projects on service design jobs, we have collected close to five thousand job descriptions for service designers. It will be interesting to sort of pick oh. through those and see mm. what the trends are. But uh, <laughs> maybe maybe in a different lifetime. Uh, <laughs> Get some AI on it, Mark. It'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I just need a little bit of funding, then we can hire a few researchers to do this. But no, that would be a really, really interesting um, exercise. Mm. Now, before our time runs out, um, by the time our conversation goes public, it will be somewhere around June or July 2024. I don't know how far the new book will be by then, but what can you tell us today about it? So the new book is basically a diagnostic tool uh, to help people to understand why their organization is struggling to deliver services that work. So essentially, it's probably all of the questions that you were left with uh, after reading Good Services where you went, hmm, this all sounds great, Lou, but how? Um, that is what good set. That's what bad services is going to be about. Um, uh, it's really a tool to help us to understand the problem and to be able to pragmatically move forward as well. So don't expect any advice that runs along the lines of now it's time to restructure your whole organization. <laughs> Because very few of us have the ability to be able to do that. So this is really about pragmatically what can we do as individuals, assuming that we don't have infinite time and budget and, um, you know, kind of seniority to be able to completely change our organizations. So what can we do to make sure that we are um, influencing our organization in the right direction and helping it to do all the things that are needed to be able to deliver better services? Um so yeah, that's really the direction the book's going in. Um, I've written 30,000 words at this stage, hopefully more by the time this podcast comes out. <laughs> um, and it should be, fingers crossed, it should be all going well, uh, available um, just after Christmas. Um, so kind of January 2025-ish sort of time. Uh, and it's coming out with Biz, um, so the publisher of Good Services. Uh, and also this is service design thinking. So um, yeah, great, great publisher and um, feel very lucky to have the opportunity to, yeah, to write uh, the sequel to Good Services. If somebody um, maybe hasn't read yet Good Services, how would you say the two books compare? I think they are part of the same story. Um, so for me, in retrospect, Good Services feels like um, the middle of a story. Um, because really what both of these books are about is creating an organization that can design and deliver better services. And for me, that comes down to kind of a sense of service literacy, which kind of has three main components to it. You know, being able to see services as real things that can and should be designed, being able to know and understand what we mean by a good service and a bad service, which is good services. And then actually committing to designing them, you know, committing the people and the time and the money and the resources and the structures and the permission and all of those other things that are really hard to find. 
And that's what bad service is about. So they are very much, you know, kind of two chapters um, of a much bigger story about actually how do we go beyond just talking about this and knowing that it's a good idea to actually seeing that change out there in the world. And how do we start to, just as we recognize the patterns in what makes a good service, recognize the patterns in what we need as an organization to be able to actually deliver those things. Um, so yeah, I hope that it it will spark some conversations um, and trigger some ideas and also help people to feel less alone in doing this work because it can feel really lonely and you know this is the the kind of sum total of all of my experience and all of the roles that I've done but also all of the experience of all of the fantastic and amazing people that we've worked with who've come through the doors of the School of Good Services and shared their experience of what it's like to do this type of work and their learnings so um, yeah thank you to everyone who's contributed to this book so far and will con contribute to it uh, in in the time between now and when it comes out maybe an additional uh opportunity here but uh is there any like two questions here if people are interested to learn more is there already a place where they can go and two is there something we can do as the service design show audience community to help mm, oh yes that absolutely um so to find out more information, um, I would definitely, first of all, go to good.services, um, which is the, the home of the School of Good Services. And there are a bunch of, and will be a bunch of blog posts about the book, sharing some of the ideas and thoughts that are kind of going into it. Um, uh, Sarah and I have also started a very different shape of podcast to this one, uh, basically a podcast called Dead Ends, um, which is basically conversations that we are having about some of these really knotty topics, like how do we actually reconnect with our users and how do we understand who they are and what they need? Um, so that's a good place to have a look there. Um, but in terms of help, I mean, gosh, if anyone has any perspectives or thoughts or stories that they are willing to share uh, uh, about you know, kind of how we spot some of the problems that we have in our organizations that creates worse services, then I would love to chat to them. Um, you know, I feel very much that this book is the representation of our kind of collective knowledge as a community. So um, I would love to to represent that. And um, yeah, if anyone has any thoughts or things, um, please do email me um, uh, at uh, the contact form that's on the website of uh, Good Bill Services. Be careful what you wish for, Lou. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> finding bad examples, as we discussed earlier, <laughs> is much easier than finding the good ones. So exactly. uh, hmm. uh, I can imagine that you'll get a few responses. Yeah. Um, is there anything you feel that we should have discussed by now, but haven't? Take things. I mean, I feel like we could probably carry on talking about this topic for ages. <laughs> um, I rack my brains. I don't know. Do, what do you think? I don't think so. But no, I don't. I don't think so. There's nothing that comes to mind. I'm happy uh, with the conversation that we had, and uh, I hope that it sparks some other interesting questions. Um, our field is going through change, and that's great. Uh, I heard people sort of quote unquote complaining that we're debating whether or not service designers is the right term. But I think having that debate internally, you know, it's healthy. Uh, it's a it's a sign of maturity, growth, evolution, change. Um, the world around us is changing, so mm -hmm. we should every now and then reflect on our own practice as well. Totally, totally. And I think there should always be a space for that, you know, and I, the the space for debating and having a really thorough conversation about what it means to do this job is an important uh, uh, part of any profession, yeah. uh, least of all profession that is still so relatively new compared to many other professions. So, um, And like you said, I think you mentioned in our prep call that the conversations that we had seven years ago wasn't the same conversation that we're having today and it's going to be different in seven years time as well so it's okay to revisit topics every now and then yeah totally and i <laughs> i love that like the last time that we we chatted was before 
uh, good services. And now we're chatting before. I hope it won't take you another seven years. <laughs> so maybe we'll do another one in seven years and I'll be like, oh, that second book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope we'll be able to do a sequel uh, uh, the, to complete the trilogy sooner yeah. than seven years. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it would. I mean, in all honesty, I, the the book is still quite. Um, I've written the first three chapters, which is why I'm more more clear on that kind of like triangle of of problems. But uh, there probably will be about ten chapters, all detailing slightly different problems. Um, in what causes a bad service and so yeah if you do have space in the schedule and you want to talk about any of those things when the book comes out and like you know kind of towards the middle of next year then i'd, I'd be very happy to so. we'll we'll make time for that yeah. conversation that would lou be awesome. thanks so much for coming on again sharing your thoughts ideas for inspiring our community for pu putting people on the journey towards good and better and great services so uh thanks for what you're doing and uh thanks for coming on excellent thanks so much for having me mark i really enjoyed revisiting some of the big questions around service design with lou that we discussed years ago what surprised me the most was the concern about the unintended consequences of professionalization in service design the idea that requiring formal qualifications could hinder diversity and limit access to the field is something that I hadn't fully considered before. Even seemingly small choices in language, like using service design practitioner instead of service designer, can have a real impact on who feels invited to participate in this work. At the same time, this got me excited about the potential for a more inclusive and accessible approach to service design where diverse perspectives are not only welcomed, but actively sought out. My biggest takeaway from this conversation is that the evolution of service design is far from over. As our field matures, we need to keep challenging our assumptions, questioning our practices, and pushing for greater inclusivity. And that's exactly what we strive to do here on the show. If you enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one big favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the YouTube algorithm, I don't care about that. But to let me know whether or not we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.